We're going to be going to the book of Mark, chapter 10, if any of you like to look in your Bibles as we go along. I'm just going to stop for a minute and just invite the Lord. Father, we come in Jesus' name this morning. Lord, I am only an instrument, and without you, I am absolutely worthless. But Lord, I know that you're faithful. You always have been. And we have come today, Lord, believing that you would have your way in this service. All of us, Lord, in here want to hear what you have to say. All of us here, Lord, want to grow in the things of the Lord. And you're the only one who can really do that in us, Lord. And I pray today that as we open the divine precious word, that it will be a lamp into our feet, a light into our path, and it will help us to draw nearer to you, Lord, and just to know you better and to know you more. And we believe you for that today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Mark chapter 10. This is a passage of scripture that is very, very common to all of you. As we read it this morning, you're going to know that you've read it many times and heard the story many times. This is not a parable. This is an event that happened in the life of Jesus Christ when he walked on this earth. And so we're going to look at that today and just see what the Lord would say to us out of this event that happened. Mark 10, 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho, and he went out of Jericho with his disciples. And a great number of people, and, uh, pardon me, I, I missed something, with his disciples and a great number of people. Pronunciation and punctuation is important. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more, a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. What an awesome story. A great story of this man, Bartimaeus, the Bible calls him the son of Timaeus. We don't know how long Bartimaeus had been blind. I read some information that said he may have been blind from birth and his father may have even been blind. But he knew what it was to be uh, rejected by society. He knew what it was to sit so many countless hours, you know, bored, right? I know people that won't work at Alliance because it's a boring job. <laughs> and I understand that, but sometimes, you know, the, the, the backbone meeting the belly up there where it will convince you to go work somewhere, right? Isn't that right, better? <laughs> I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. You know, that's how it is. Uh, but thank God for people who will be committed regardless. And thank God we don't have to always be happy and satisfied every minute of the day with everything that we need to do in order to get to where we need to go. That's another sermon. I'm not going there, but I had to put that in there. But blind Bartimaeus lived a pretty boring life. First of all, he couldn't see, right? He didn't know what was going on around him. Every day he went out and sat on the side of the road, I would say kind of sat in the ditch over there, and he rattled his cup or he called out to people 
uh, asking for donations, and, and this is the only way. You know, back then there was no certain, no government that could help them at all, and, and no provisions that had been made for blind people and people with disabilities. So the only way they had, had any help or any way to get any help was to go sit beside the road and depend on the generosity of those who came around to be generous enough to help them to be able to survive, to make a living, to feed themselves or whoever else they were responsible for. I don't know how long he had done this, but he's a grown man. So I've got a feeling he had sat there a long, long time. And every day was just a repeat of the day before. Humdrum, humdrum, humdrum every day of his life, just trying to get an existence out of the world he was living in. Lonely, broken in many ways, and only God knows the agony that he experienced daily sitting in that place. But I do know one thing. He knew what misery was. He knew what misery was, and misery is the object of mercy. Misery is the object of mercy. You know, when we get miserable enough, we need some mercy. Come on, we need, we need intervention of God. We need the mercy of God to begin to flow in our direction. And, and I just want to say, you know, examine our hearts this morning to find out, am I miserable, Lord? Am I living below my means? Am I living in a state where I am pretty miserable? I have been there. Yes. I've been there even when I was a Christian, even when I was preaching, teaching, and leading worship and praise. I lived for a period of time a very miserable existence because I was I was not receiving the provision that Christ had made for me. Oh, I cried out sometimes, but I cried out of a misunderstanding of the great provider and all that had been provided for me. So consequently, I stayed pretty miserable for quite a few years until by the grace of God one day, hallelujah, I got miserable enough or God got ready for me to move to a different place and he intervened and thank God I'm not miserable anymore but there may be somebody here this morning and you came to church and in the back of your mind you're realizing you know my life is not all that good and I'm pretty miserable and until we admit where we are and understand how much we need from God we're never going to reach out any further than we already are you know keep doing the same thing over and over again Bon Bartimaeus definitely was doing the same thing over and over again, but often we can do that when we don't even have to. He didn't really have much choice as far as he knew, but we can do that when we don't really have to. We really do, and I've been taught, if you've been coming to this church very often, you have been taught thoroughly and over and over abundantly of the provision of the cross and what Christ has done to give you your needs and to work things in your life so you know your provision. Blind Bartimaeus really didn't know. He was ignorant. But you know what? He had heard about Jesus. He didn't really know anything about him. He didn't know why Jesus came. He didn't know anything about the story of this being the Messiah. He really didn't know who this was. But you know what he had heard? He had heard that this man had healed the blind people before. Hallelujah. You need to hear about how God has done great things for people before. You really do. You need to celebrate. You know, thank God for the hand of God that has been upon somebody's life. God brought somebody out of this or out of that because I need to rejoice so that I can believe that God will do the same thing for me. Because God is no respecter of person. So he had heard these things and he became uncomfortable. He became uncomfortable. He was miserable. He became uncomfortable with the way things were. And, and you know, he and the past had, didn't have a good way to find a better solution. But today, you know, I don't know how long he sat there, but I believe that blind Bartimaeus had heard about this man who had healed the sick, who had, who had raised the dead, who had opened blinded eyes. And I believe that deep in his heart, there must have been this thought, if I could just somehow or another get in the vicinity of where Jesus is, how can I do that? Being blind and being unable to, you know, not very many people want to become your 
eyes and really take you everywhere you need to go. And he, he wasn't one of those who had the, evidently those four friends to let you down through the roof of the house. So he's sitting there, and I believe in his spirit he is waiting because the Bible says he heard that this was Jesus. He was heard, he had heard that this was Jesus that was coming this way. And you know what he did? He got sick and tired enough. Come on. He got sick and tired enough of his mess. He got sick and tired enough of, of a repeating the same destructive thing all the time. Until we get to that place to admit we are in desperate need. Until we get to that place, you know there's one thing I agree with AA, and that is that if you won't admit you're an alcoholic, you'll never get free. You've got to be willing to say, I am an alcoholic. I'm just glad to tell you, you don't have to keep saying it the rest of your life. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have to come to that point. Or you might need to say, I am a liar. I seem to not get the victory over lying. Or maybe there's something else. Maybe you say, I'm a gossiper. I can't seem to get the victory over gossip. I'm, I've got this problem. I've got that problem. I need a prayer life. I don't have a prayer life. I need to, I need to walk I'm this. I need to get miserable enough in all of these things to say, this is not where I want to be. This is not where I want to be. Have you ever gotten that, that tired of something? I know some of you have. Yes. You're getting so tired of something. You said, God, I'm, I'm, I'm really in a critical, miserable state, and I'm ready for a change. Everybody say, ready for a change. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Ready for a change. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of being weak. I'm tired of giving up. I'm tired of repeating the same old junk every day. Right. I'm tired of that. And you know what he did? He could have just sat there and complained. Right. He could have just sat there and complained. He could have said, well, Jesus is there, but he probably didn't want to hear me. He could have just said, well, there's other people up there. I don't want to bother Jesus. Come on. Can you imagine people thinking that? Or he might have just said, well, you know, if I get to crying out, somebody's going to tell me to shut up. He could have just sat there. He had a choice, and you have a choice, and I have a choice. Praise God. But he didn't want to do that. He was so sick and tired of where he was that the number one focus of his life was to get the attention of God. Because yes. that's who he was crying out to. Because Jesus is God. Yes. He said, I know the only one who's going to be able to help me. I don't care how loud I have to holler. I don't care how many times I have to holler. He made it with God when he first started out that word Jesus that he wasn't going to quit. You believe that? Yes. He wasn't going to quit. He, he hollered out that name, Jesus of Nazareth. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Yes. He began to cry that out. He began to hoping and, and praying and believing that somehow or another God was going to stop. Well, the Bible says Jesus stood still. Because somebody who gets desperate enough before God will cause him to show up and be still in your presence. And reach out to you by his grace, just like he did Bartimaeus. Because that's the kind of God we serve. He cares about you. He cares about your circumstances. He is a caring and loving God. And you've got to believe just like uh, Bartimaeus began to believe, hey, all things are possible. This seemed hard and impossible. Some of you are dealing with things that are hard and impossible. But I'm here to tell you today that you serve a God. That there is nothing too difficult for my God. Amen. Nothing. Amen. Nothing. Don't let the devil convince you to shut up. Don't let the devil convince you to, keep, to quit crying out. That's what he's going to do because that's what he did to Bartimaeus. Right. He works the same old tricks all the time. They, the naysayers, the people speaking logically. Right. That's a bad word in Christianity. Christianity is not all about logic. Come on. The Bible's not very logical. 
So if you're requiring logic, you're going to have trouble with the Bible. It's not logical. It's not what everybody thinks ought to be done. The naysayers were quick to raise up. As soon as he began to get out of his rut, right. somebody wanted to get him back in his rut. Come on. Yeah. There's somebody that wants you to stay in your rut. There's somebody that wants you to act like they want you to act. Come on. It's true. Yep. There are people that are going to criticize you all the time. They're too late. They don't talk right. They, uh, they don't know how to really speak in tongues. They don't. They're too loud. Somebody needs to quit hollering. Somebody needs to not play the guitar or the bass or the, or the piano. They, they just ain't doing it right. Come on. When you step up to do anything for Jesus, somebody's going to naysay you. Somebody's got to criticize you. Somebody's got to try to get you to stay in your rut. Some of you know. Perry and, and Vaughn know. That when you make a decision to get out of your rut, you're going to have some people saying, it ain't going to last. Come on now. It ain't going to last. Oh, they'll be back in the ditch in a few days. Come on. But I'm going to tell you, they've been waiting a long time, haven't they, Perry? Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. They've been waiting a while on you too, Vaughn. And I'm convinced you ain't going back in the ditch. Hallelujah. Because the ditch stinks. And the ditch is hard. And the ditch is difficult. And nobody deserves to live there that's a child of God. Come on. Those naysayers and those logic thinkers always saying, get back. Get back. Shut up. Shut up. Don't do that. Don't be so, don't be so radical. Don't get so excited. Come on. There are going to be some people like that in your life. It might even be your spouse. But you got to get up and say, as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. And I'm going to run to Jesus. I don't care. If you want to run with me, go. Come on. And if you don't, just sit here and just watch me. Come on. Instead of saying, I don't want anybody to watch me, say, come on. Watch me. Come on. So these naysayers, these discouragers, you know, there's always been those all the way through the Bible. And there still is today. The widow woman and the unjust judge. The, the story that Jesus told. Somebody, you know, she just kept on. The judge said, I don't want to hear you. Get out of here. I don't want to hear you. You know, she didn't give up. Then I thought about uh, in Matthew chapter 19, the, the parents who came to bring their children for Jesus to bless them. If they had gone by what the crowd said, they would have took their children and walked meekly away from Jesus. But they didn't listen to those people who said, keep them back. Don't bother the master. No, I believe those parents had those children in their hands and they were pushing through. They were pushing against the naysayers. They were pushing against the people that didn't believe that they should be there. And they went right up to where Jesus was and they got his attention and he said, come on, bring them here. That's right. Just because people tell you God ain't going to do it don't mean a thing in this world, church. Amen. Another one, you know, uh, in Mark 17, uh, the father whose son had a demon. And he, and he took him to the disciples. And the Bible says the disciples tried to cast him out, but they couldn't. <laughs> but he didn't give up. He went to the disciples and there was a demon. It's fighting this terrible battle with his son. And he was just like Bartimaeus. He was desperate. He was so desperate. He didn't want to have to live this way. He didn't want his child to have to live this way the rest of his life. And even though he took him to the disciples, and even though it didn't work and that did, did nothing happen, he didn't give up like sometimes we do. We pray once or twice. We get excited. We come down for prayer. And then we go away and we got a little pain. And we got, oh, we give up too quick. I'm going to tell you, we got to keep pushing in. We just got to keep pushing in. This man did. He said, I'm going to Jesus. I'm going to bypass these people. I know that he, these weren't bad people, but they had failed in what he had gone there to receive. And he didn't let that upset him or bother him. He just went right on past them, and he went right to Jesus. And Jesus delivered his son from demon power. And, of course, the Apostle Paul is one of the greatest examples. Here was a man who had gone out trying to kill all the Christians. And when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, <laughs> Jesus gave him a commission. And he faced opposition everywhere he went. Everybody, the church didn't want him. Come on. The church didn't want him. I was reading this morning that some of the Muslims who are being saved today, the churches in their vicinities 
don't want them because they're scared of them and they won't bring them into their fellowship. I want you to know it's time for the church to let God be in charge. God can save whoever he wants to save. God can heal whoever he wants to heal. God can deliver whoever he wants to deliver. It's not our business to try to tell God how to do his business, but to turn it all loose and say, God, we just want you to do what you want to do. Every minute of the day, I want to depend on your grace because you're the only one who really knows what it's going to take. And I am desperate enough that I'm ready to see what God can do in Natchitoches, Louisiana. I don't care who says what about Oasis of Love. Oh, you may hear some gossip. Just forget about it. I haven't heard any. So don't say that. Don't get to thinking on that. I'm just saying, don't worry about what anybody says. God's not through with Oasis of Love. God is raising up an army in Oasis of Love. And it's time for us to press in. And no matter what anybody says, it doesn't matter because God is on the throne and he can do anything with anybody who will move out in his will. One of the greatest preachers in America today who's seeing thousands and thousands of people coming to God is 83 years old. God's not through with anybody. God's not through with anybody till you give up. And when you give up, you'll be in that position. The first thing that blind Bartimaeus did when Jesus called his name, he got rid of everything that hindered him. <laughs> He got rid. The Bible says he, he cast off his garment and rose and came to Jesus. I know you could use a lot of applications to that verse, but this is the one God gave me. Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us we've all got a race and some of us are trying to wear run that race in in lead boots time to get rid of the boots it's time to get rid of the excuses it's time to get rid of the naysayers it's time to get rid of those people who don't believe this and do believe that we got a whole world that's deceived. But you don't have to be. And I don't have to be by the grace of God. Because I've got the truth on my coffee table. i got the truth on the table beside my chair. i got the truth right here on my iPad. i got the truth everywhere I want to go. And there is only one truth. And it is absolute truth. And I will walk in it by the grace of God. And therefore, I can lay aside every weight. That, that's besetting me. Not just sin. Those sins will definitely beset you. Definitely. That's right. But I need to say, God, where, where are any weights? Where are any weights? Ask Him. Because I can't tell you what your weights are. But God tells me. God tells me. And if He'll tell me, He'll tell you. Has He ever put His finger on you and said, that's in my way. Yeah. Quit fighting for it. Get rid of it. Yeah. But I want that. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. It's like, a, it's like a string holding you back. It's like something that's keeping the butterfly from flying. Come on. Get rid of it. There's nothing on this planet that's worth the hindrance of moving where you need to go. Nothing. Nothing or no one that is in our life that wants to hold us back from where we need to be in Jesus is worth it. We gotta let it go and say, God, I'm going regardless. Cut those strings, cut them all loose so that you can't even go back to where you came from. Some of us got rubber bands on us. We get up from the altar and get, get, uh, hear this message today. Woo, I'm getting up and I'm going free. And you take off and then get away. Don't want to do that. Cut them loose. Cut them loose. So there's no path back. More than just his physical eyes were opened. 
Can you imagine? I'm going to play like I know the Bar blind Barnabas had been blind from birth. Is that okay? But even if he had been blind almost all his life, can you imagine? Total black. I can't even. I've always thought being blind would be the worst hindrance to anybody's life. Can you mind? St stone black is all he could see. And when he walked up to Jesus and his eyes were open, the first thing he saw was Jesus face. Amen. It don't get any better than that. He saw Jesus' face and Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, Bartimaeus. Notice Jesus' words. Go thy way, Bartimaeus. Thy faith hath made thee whole. But look at this. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Amen. Blind Bartimaeus' way became Jesus' way. He didn't have another way. He didn't say, oh, well, good, let me get back to my family and do all my blah, 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 blah. No. He saw the faith of Jesus, and the Bible says, and he followed Jesus in the way. When our spiritual eyes are open to really see Jesus, I'm not talking about some picture of Jesus. I'm talking about the reality of Jesus, yes. his presence. Amen. When our spiritual eyes are open to truly see Jesus, truly see him, we will also run after him. Lord. How could you know him and not want to be with him? Amen. How could you know him and not want to be with him? See, I, I, I know my husband well and I enjoy his company. I don't want him from me. He says, I'm coming home. Well, let me go somewhere. Uh-uh. When he says, I'm coming home, I say, great. I'm happy you're coming home. Why? Because I enjoy his company. And many of you as well. I don't run from you. When I see you in Walmart, I don't go, oh, my goodness. There's Jenna. Let me go around the other <laughs> I don't say that. No, I say, oh, there's Jenna. Let me run over there and speak to her. Why? I know her. And I love her. And I want to talk to her. See, I know him. Amen. He's been my best friend all my life. He's never thrown me away when I didn't do everything he wanted done. He's loved me through every storm. I love him. When our spiritual eyes become open to him, instead of getting up in the morning thinking about where we got to go and do this, that, and the other, we're going to get up in the morning thinking, let me run talk to Jesus just a little bit. Maybe at other times during the day when we have that opportunity. Matthew 12 and 41. Listen to this. Matthew 12 and 41 says, The men of, of, of Nineveh, this is Jesus talking, shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. You realize how great Jesus is? We can't even begin to really realize. God feels this universe. He is the truth. He is the all in all. He is the ultimate supreme being of all time and space. His expanse, his presence, his 
power, his beauty, his glory is beyond our human comprehension. And we go by and say, good morning, Jesus. Uh, I love Jesus. He's good. I wouldn't even do that to the president. I wouldn't do that to our governor. I'd stop. If I met the governor downtown, I'd stop. I had the opportunity, wouldn't you? Stop and look at him and see if there's any good wisdom I could get from him. I would. I would stop. I had the opportunity to talk to him for a few minutes. I wouldn't get in a hurry. Would you? I wouldn't get in a hurry if I had the opportunity to meet somebody like that. Oh my, 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 my. What a, what a, I don't know. I guess just a peony difference between that and going in the presence of God. Going into the presence of God. A greater than Jonas is here this morning. Not me. But the words that I'm speaking to you are greater than Jonas's words. Because they are from him. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We, we must see him in the fear of the Lord. James 5 and 9 says, Grudge not one another against one another, brethren, lest we be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. We honor him as the uh, absolute judge. You know, his judgments can never be overturned. If the last word you hear is depart from me, I never knew you, you won't have an appeal. I pray that there's not one here today who has that in their future. But there is no appeal when God says, depart from me, I never knew you. There is no court, nor lawyer, nor person who can get you out of your trouble. He is the absolute judge of the world. And if I butt up against his word and his will, the ending is not going to be good for me. I'm going to keep butting my head against a brick wall until I destroy myself. Because this wall of God, this power of God is not going to move or be changed. So I honor him as the judge of the universe, the one who what he has said is the only thing that matters. We must see him as God, our redeemer. John 20 and 27 says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Seeing him as our redeeming Savior, our Redeemer. We were bought with His blood. No one else could have saved us. Brother Mark dealt with that this morning. No one else could have saved you from the pits of hell. No one else. And so I celebrate those wounded hands and those wounded feet and that wounded side and yield in His presence as my Redeemer. I see Him as my beckoning beckoning Savior. Roman, uh, Revelation 3 and 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. I will sup with him and he with me. Right now, today, he's calling us. Always knocking. Always calling. He is also my sure foundation. 1 Peter 2 and 6 says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, look, that word behold means look. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And guess what? He's our coming king. Revelation 1 and 7 says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. 
and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. One of these days, and I believe it could be today, I believe with all my heart we are living in the days of the rapture of the church. There will be a period of time before he actually comes in the clouds and sets his feet upon this earth. But we're living in the day that the rapture of the church could happen at any time. God's not going to make a mistake about who he takes with him and who stays behind. It's so important that I make up my mind I'm going to run after him. I'm going to run after him against all the naysayers, against all the logical people, against all of those people. Doesn't matter. Just get out of my way. Because I'm going to run after him. Because above all else, when he comes, I want to see him face to face. All who see him, all who see him will run after him. Are you getting a hold of that? All who see him will run after him. I just ask you this morning, are you miserable enough? Are you tired of some things? Are you ready to forget what anybody else says? Anybody's opinion or anybody's junk? Are you ready? If you're ready for that, say, Lord, I want to run after you more than I ever have before. I've asked Jerry to sing a song that talks about seeing Jesus, about coming and seeing him. As, as they, she does this song, and you can say in your heart there are some things that have been distracting me might not be bad things there have been some things that have been distracting me and I'm kind of kind of faltering in my run I don't mean you're sinner and you're lost you're going to hell but I just want to I want to focus I want my eyes open so that I can see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Because most of all, I want to see him in the sky. To You're here this morning. You say, Sister Francis, I want to make a recommitment. I'm a child of God. I'm not lost. But I want to make a recommitment to run after Jesus with all my heart. I want to see his face. I want to see his face. And I want to hear his voice. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. I want to, more than ever, I'm hungry. And I've been miserable long enough. Maybe you're not miserable. But maybe there are things that you're miserable about. And if you say, I've been there long enough, I'm ready to call out and I want to see the face of Jesus if nobody else does. And I'm not going to let anybody get in my way. That's you, and you're standing now, and you want to stand with these. I want these just to come right down here to the front. Just walk down here. Come right down here. Anybody else that wants to join them, just say, I'm ready. I'm sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of these things. I'm ready to run after Jesus, believing that everything he said in his word is true. Right now, Jesus, and if you're here and you're not sure that you're ready to meet Jesus, if you'll just come right here and stand in the front, I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you right now before you leave. Stand right here in the middle. In Jesus' name, Lord. Father, I come to you for all of these who come forward. Lord, all of these are people who love you. But Lord, there's things that they're dealing with in their lives that they're tired of dealing with. And Lord, they join this morning with my Barnabas. They may feel like they're in a ditch a little bit somewhere in their lives. Some area of their life is kind of in a ditch, oh God. And Lord, they have come this morning to say no to all of those naysayers. 
and to say, I don't care what anybody else does or says. I am reaching forward out of this ditch, out of this situation, out of this physical disorder. Because your word is true and you are God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you're faithful and I will not be denied this morning. Lord, as I look into your face, I want to see it more clearly than ever before. Lord, I want to have the revelation of who you are more than ever before in my life. God, that I may run to you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. To commit my way unto you and to believe, God, that you will perfect everything that concerns me. Whether it be health, or situations, finances, broken relationships, heartbreaking circumstances. Father, it doesn't matter what it is. You're bigger than every bit of it. In Jesus' name, Lord, I lay hold of the promises of your word for these. Stand in agreement with each one of them right now. God, you know why they came. You know the key issue. You know, and you're bigger than that. And you're more important than that. So as they release these things to you at the altar right now, they release them in Jesus' name. And anything else you put on their hearts right now, that they can truly let these things go. Turn loose. Throw off that old garment of begging. Throw off that old garment that hinders right now in Jesus' name. To walk clearly and freely into all your provision this morning. We stand with you right now. Yes, open your, open my eyes. I want to see Jesus. I want to reach out and touch you. Oh, yes. And say how much I love you. Lord, I ask you to open my ears. Lord, that I can hear. And help me to listen.
those eyes open and let Jesus show you himself this morning, please. God bless you. You may consider yourselves just this if you want to.